Disclaimer. The following audiobook presentation of Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia is intended for educational and informational purposes only. This is a non-commercial project by DisinfoZone aimed at disseminating this seminal work to a new audience interested in ufology. We assert that this falls under fair use under United States copyright law, serving the public interest without affecting the market for the original work. We highly recommend purchasing a copy of this book, as well as other works by Jacques Vallée, to support his invaluable contributions to the field. Visuals in this presentation are produced by Static Void Studio, to whom we are deeply indebted. Chapter 2. The Good People Quote, Man's imagination, like every known power, works by fixed laws, the existence and operation of which it is possible to trace. And it works upon the same material the external universe, the mental and moral constitution of man and his social relations. Hence, diverse as may seem at first sight, the results among the cultured Europeans and the debased Hottentots, the philosophical Hindus and the Red Indians of the Far West, they present on a close examination features absolutely identical. End quote. Edwin S. Hartland, The Science of Fairy Tales, An Inquiry into Fairy Mythology. It was an unusual day for the Food and Drug Laboratory of the U.S. Department of Health, Education and Welfare when the Air Force requested an analysis of a piece of wheat cake that had been cooked aboard a flying saucer. The human being who had obtained the cake was Joe Simonton, a 60-year-old chicken farmer who lived alone in a small house in the vicinity of Eagle River, Wisconsin. He was given three cakes, ate one of them, and thought it tasted like cardboard. The Air Force put it more scientifically, quote, The cake was composed of hydrogenated fat, starch, buckwheat hulls, soya bean hulls, wheat bran. Bacteria and radiation readings were normal for this material. Chemical, infrared and other destructive type tests were run on this material. The Food and Drug Laboratory of the U.S. Department of Health, Education and Welfare concluded that the material was an ordinary pancake of terrestrial origin. End quote. Where did it come from? The reader will have to decide for himself what he chooses to believe after reading this second chapter. It begins with the Eagle River incident because this is a first-hand account given by a man of absolute sincerity. Speaking for the U.S. Air Force, Dr. Alan Hynek, who investigated the case along with Major Robert Friend and an officer from Sawyer Air Force Base, stated, quote, There is no question that Mr. Simonton felt that his contact had been a real experience. End quote. The time was approximately 11 a.m. on April 18, 1961 when Joe Simonton was attracted outside by a peculiar noise similar to knobby tires on a wet pavement. Stepping into his yard, he faced a silvery saucer-shaped object, brighter than chrome, which appeared to be hovering close to the ground without actually touching it. The object was about 12 feet high and 30 feet in diameter. A hatch opened about 5 feet from the ground, and Simonton saw three men inside the machine, one of them was dressed in a black two-piece suit. The occupants were about five feet in height. Smooth-shaven, they appeared to resemble Italians. They had dark hair and skin and wore outfits with turtleneck tops and knit helmets. One of the men held up a jug, apparently made of the same material as the saucer. His motions to Joe Simonton seemed to indicate that he needed water. Simonton took the jug, went inside the house and filled it. As he returned, he saw that one of the men inside the saucer was frying food on a flameless grill of some sort. The interior of the ship was black, the color of wrought iron. Simonton, who could see several instrument panels, heard a slow whining sound, similar to the hum of a generator. When he made a motion indicating he was interested in the food that was being prepared, one of the men who was also dressed in black but with a narrow red trim along the trousers, handed him three cookies about three inches in diameter and perforated with small holes. The whole affair had lasted about five minutes. 
Finally, the man closest to the witness attached a kind of belt to a hook in his clothing and closed the hatch in such a way that Simonton could scarcely detect its outline. Then the object rose about 20 feet from the ground before taking off straight south, causing a blast of air that bowed some nearby pine trees. Along the edge of the saucer, the witness recalls, were exhaust pipes six or seven inches in diameter. The hatch was about six feet high and 30 inches wide, and although the object has always been described as a saucer, its shape was that of two inverted bowls. When two deputies sent by Sheriff Schroeder, who had known Simonton for 14 years, arrived on the scene, they could not find any corroborative evidence. The sheriff affirmed that the witness obviously believed the truth of what he was saying and talked very sensibly about the incident. Food from Fairyland The Eagle River case has never been solved. The Air Force believes that Joe Simonton, who lived alone, had a sudden dream while he was awake and inserted his dream into the continuum of events around him of which he was conscious. I understand several psychologists in Dayton, Ohio, are quite satisfied with this explanation, and so are most serious amateur ufologists. Alas, ufology, like psychology, has become such a narrow field of specialization that the experts have no time left for general culture. They're so busy rationalizing the dreams of other people that they themselves do not dream anymore, nor do they read fairy tales. If they did, they would perhaps take a much closer look at Joe Simonton and his pancakes. They would know about the gentry and the food from Fairyland. In 1909, an American, Wentz, who wrote a thesis on Celtic traditions in Brittany, devoted much time to the gathering of folk tales about supernatural beings, their habits, their contacts with men, and their food. In his book, he gives the story of Pat Feeney, an Irishman of whom we know only that he was well off before the hard times, meaning perhaps the famine of 1846-1847. One day a little woman came to his house and asked for some oatmeal. Quote, Paddy had so little that he was ashamed to offer it, so he offered her some potatoes instead, but she wanted oatmeal, and then he gave her all that he had. She told him to place it back in the bin till she should return for it. This he did and the next morning the bin was overflowing with oatmeal. The woman was one of the gentry." End quote. It is unfortunate that Paddy did not save this valuable evidence for the benefit of the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare, Food and Drug Lab. Perhaps they would have explained this miracle of the multiplication of the oatmeal, along with other peculiar properties of fairy food, for it is well known in Ireland that if you are taken away by the fairies, you must never taste food in their palace, Otherwise, you never come back. You become one of them. It is interesting that the analysis performed for the Air Force did not mention the presence of salt in the pancakes given to Simonton. Indeed, Wentz was told by an Irishman who was quite familiar with the gentry that they never taste anything salt but eat fresh meat and drink pure water. Pure water is what the saucer men took from Simonton. The question of food is one of the points most frequently treated in the traditional literature of the Celtic legends, along with the documented stories of babies kidnapped by the elves and of the terrestrial animals they hunt and take away. Before we study this abundant material, however, we should supply some background information about the mysterious folks the Irish call the gentry and the Scots, the good people, Slee Maith. Quote, the gentry are a fine, large race who live out on the sea and in the mountains, and they are all very good neighbors. The bad ones are not the gentry at all, are the fallen angels, and they live in the woods and the sea. End quote, says one of Wentz's informers. Patrick Water gives this description of a fairy man. Quote, a crowd of boys out in the fields one day saw a fairy man with a red cap. Except for his height, he was like any other man. He was about three and a half feet tall. The boys surrounded him, but he made such a sputtering talk they let him go. And he disappeared as he walked away in the direction of the old fort." End quote. There were few places where one could still see fairies, even in Great Britain or France after 1850. All the storytellers, all the popular almanacs agree that as civilization advanced, the little folks became increasingly shy. A few untouched places recommended by Wentz, however, are the Yosemite Valley in California and the Ben Bulban country and Ross Point in County Sligo, Ireland. 
Dublin seers are known to have made many trips to Ben Bulban, a famous mountain honeycombed with curious grottos. At the very foot of the mountain, as the heavy white fog banks hung over Ben Bulban and its neighbors, Wentz was told, the following incident occurred. Quote, when I was a young man, I often used to go out in the mountains over there to fish for trout or to hunt. And it was in January on a cold, dry day, while carrying my gun, that I and a friend with me as we were walking around Ben Bulban saw one of the gentry for the first time. This one was dressed in blue with a headdress adorned with what seemed to be frills. When he came upon us, he said to me in a sweet and silvery voice, the seldom you come to this mountain, the better, mister. A young lady here wants to take you away. Then he told us not to fire our guns, because the gentry dislike being disturbed by the noise, and he seemed to be like a soldier of the gentry on guard. As we were leaving the mountain, he told us not to look back, and we didn't, end quote. Wentz then asked for a description of the gentry, and was told the following, quote, the folk are the grandest I have ever seen. They are far superior to us, and that is why they call themselves the gentry. They are not a working class, but a military aristocratic class, tall and noble appearing. They are a distinct race between our race and that of spirits, as they have told me. Their qualifications are tremendous. We could cut off half the human race, but would not, they said, for we are expecting salvation. And I knew a man three or four years ago whom they struck down with paralysis. Their sight is so penetrating that I think they could see through the earth. They have a silvery voice, quick and sweet. The gentry live inside the mountains in beautiful castles, and there are a good many branches of them in other countries, and especially in Ireland. Some live in the Wicklow Mountains near Dublin. Like armies, they have their stations and move from one to another. My guide and informer said to me once, I command a regiment, Mr. They travel greatly, and they can appear in Paris, Marseille, Naples, Genoa, Turin or Dublin, like ordinary people and even in crowds. They love especially Spain, southern France and the south of Europe. The gentry take a great interest in the affairs of men, and they always stand for justice and right. Sometimes they fight among themselves. They take young and intelligent people who are interesting. They take the whole body and soul, transmuting the body to a body like their own. I asked them once if they ever died, and they said, No, we are always kept young, mister. Once they take you and you taste food in their palace, you cannot come back. They never taste anything salt, but eat fresh meat and drink pure water. They marry and have children, and one of them could marry a good and pure mortal. They are able to appear in different forms. One once appeared to me and seemed only four feet high and stoutly built. He said, I'm bigger than I appear to you now. We can make the old young, the big small, the small big." End quote. Now that we have refreshed the reader's memory regarding the gentry, perhaps we shall be forgiven for driving the parallel between fairy faith and ufology a good deal further. The Eagle River incident again will be the occasion for our reflections. The cakes given to Joe Simonton were composed of, among other things, buckwheat hulls. And buckwheat is closely associated with legends of Brittany, one of the most conservative Celtic areas. In that area of France, belief in fairies or fees is still widespread. Although Wentz and Paul Sebilo had great difficulty, about 1900, finding Bretons who said that they themselves had seen fees. One of the peculiarities of Breton traditional legends is the association of the fees or corrigans with a race of beings named fions. In our chapter on the secret commonwealth, we shall study the Fians more closely. Here I want only to call the reader's attention to one particularly pretty legend about Fians and magic buckwheat cakes. It seems that once upon a time a black cow belonging to little cave-dwelling Fians ruined the buckwheat field of a poor woman who bitterly complained about the damage. The Fians made a deal with her. They would see to it that she should never run out of buckwheat cakes, provided she kept her mouth shut. And indeed, she and her family discovered that their supply of cakes was inexhaustible. Alas, one day the woman gave some of the cake to a man who should not have been entrusted with the secret of its magical origin, and the family had to go back to the ordinary way of making buckwheat cakes. I hardly need remind the reader that the Bible, too, gives a few examples of magical food supplies, similarly inexhaustible. Moreover, stories narrated by actual people provide close parallels to this theme. 
Witness the following account given by Hartland. Quote, a man who lived at Eastrad Finlace in Brecknockshire, going out one day to look after his cattle and sheep on the mountain, disappeared. In about three weeks, after search had been made in vain for him and his wife had given him up for dead, he came home. His wife asked him where he had been for the last three weeks. Three weeks? Is it three weeks you call three hours? said he. Pressed to say where he had been, he told her he had been playing his flute, which he usually took with him on the mountain, at the Ljorfa, a spot near the Van Pool, when he was surrounded at a distance by little beings like men who closed nearer and nearer to him until they became a very small circle. They sang and danced, and so affected him that he quite lost himself. They offered him some small cakes to eat, of which he partook, and he had never enjoyed himself so well in his life." End quote. Wentz, too, has a few stories about the food from Fairyland. He gathered them during his trips through the Celtic countries in the first few years of the present century. John McNeil of Barra, an old man who spoke no English, told Michael Buchanan, who translated the story from the Gaelic for Wentz, a pretty tale about a girl who was taken by the fairies. The fairies, he said, took the girl into their dwelling and set her to work baking oat cakes. But no matter how much meal she took from the closet, there was always the same amount left on the shelf. And she had to keep baking and baking until the old fairy man took pity on her and said, I am sure you are wearying of the time and thinking long of getting from our premises, and I will direct you to the means by which you can get your leave. Whatever remainder of meal falls from the cakes after being baked put into the meal closet, and that will stimulate my wife to give you leave. Naturally, she did as directed and got away. John McNeil, who was between 70 and 80 years old, gave no date to the story. But since he said he saw the girl after her experience, the event probably took place in the second part of the 19th century. Scientifically inclined people scoff at such stories with a very indignant air. A group of UFO students, when contacted about the Eagle River incident, stated that they did not intend to analyze the cookies, planned no further action, and had much more important things to investigate. Two weeks after the sighting, Joe Simonton told a United Press International reporter that if it happened again, I don't think I'd tell anybody about it. And indeed, if flying saucers are devices used by a super-scientific civilization from space, we would expect them to be packed inside with electronic gadgetry, super radars, and a big computerized spying apparatus. But visitors in human shape, who breathe our air and zip around in flying kitchenettes, that is too much, Mr. Simonton. Visitors from the stars would not be human or humanoid. They would not dare come here without receiving a polite invitation from our powerful radio telescopes. For centuries, we would exchange highly scientific information through exquisite circuitry and elaborate codes. And even if they did come here, surely they would land in Washington, D.C., where the President of the United States and the scientific ufologists would greet them. Presents would be exchanged. We would offer books on exobiology. They would give us photographs of our solar system taken through space telescopes. But perforated, cardboard-tasting, pancake-shaped buckwheat cakes. How terribly rural, Mr. Simonton. And yet there is no question that Joe Simonton believes that he saw the flying saucer, the nameless grill, the three men. He gave them pure water. They gave him three pancakes. If we reflect on this very simple event, as the students of folklore have reflected on the stories quoted above, we cannot overlook one possibility, that the event at Eagle River did happen, and that it has the meaning of a simple yet grandiose ceremony. This latter theory was very well expressed by Hartland when he said about the exchange of food with fairies, quote, almost all over the earth, the right of hospitality has been held to confer obligations on its recipient and to unite him by special ties to the giver. And even where the notion of hospitality does not enter, to join in a common meal has often been held to symbolize, if not to constitute, union of a very sacred kind. That such meaning is still attached to a common meal is readily seen at weddings and other traditional meetings where food is an important constituent, even if the symbolic value of such events is lost to most of our contemporaries. Hartland goes as far as to suggest that the custom of burying the dead with some food 
might bear some relationship to the widespread belief that one must have a supply of terrestrial food when one reaches fairyland or forsake the earth entirely. And indeed, in ancient and recent tradition alike, the abode of our supernatural visitors is not always distinct from the world of the dead. This is a moot point, however, because the same applies to visitors from heaven. The theologians who argue about the nature of angels know it very well. But at least the idea of food provides another connection. In the light of Hartland's remarks about the right of hospitality, a passage from the Bible is noteworthy. Quote, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort you your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And he took butter and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat." End quote. And according to Genesis chapter 19 verse 3, Lot took the two angels he met at the gate of Sodom to his house, quote, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. End quote. So after all, Joe Simonton's account might be a modern illustration of that biblical recommendation. Quote, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware." End quote. Rings in the Moonlight This section is devoted to several types of artifacts claimed by popular tradition to be of supernatural origin. Fairy rings and saucer nests obviously fall in this category. Although such phenomena are treated as borderline cases by specialists in UFO investigation, I believe the nests deserve more than passing attention and should be considered in the light of specific traditional beliefs about the meaning of the magic circles that for centuries farmers have found in their fields. The literature on this subject is of course abundant, and we shall select only a few cases to illustrate the point and set the stage for a more detailed discussion in later chapters. On Thursday, July 28, 1966, in the evening, Mr. Lacoste and his wife were walking in the vicinity of Montsoreau, Maine-et-Loire, France. All of a sudden, they saw a red sphere cross the sky like a meteor. It did not behave quite as a meteor, however, because it seemed to touch the ground and then rise again, without losing its brilliant red color, and hover at mid-height for a while before it was lost to sight. A check was made for military experiments in the area. There were none. The next day, a Montsoreau farmer, Alain Rouillet, reported that a nine-square-yard area of his wheat field had been flattened and covered with a yellowish, oily substance. Further investigation disclosed additional details on the identity of the witnesses and substantiated the idea that a peculiar object had indeed landed. Lacoste is a photographer in Saumur. Unfortunately, he did not carry a camera with him at the time. He described the light given off by the sphere as being so intense that it lit up the whole countryside. The sphere hovered, he said, for a few seconds, then it maneuvered close to the ground. The witnesses felt sure it was a guided military gadget and walked to a distance of about 400 yards from the object, which went away and was lost to sight behind some woods. The whole sighting had lasted four minutes. Six months earlier, a rash of similar sightings had made headlines in Australia. More flying saucer nests was the big news on the front page of the Sydney Sun-Herald for January 23, 1966. Three nests had been discovered in Queensland, circular clearings of dead reeds surrounded by green reeds. Hundreds of sightseers were searching for more by the time the reports were published. On January 19, 1966, at 9 a.m., a 27-year-old banana grower, George Pedley, was driving his tractor in the vicinity of a swamp called Horseshoe Lagoon when he suddenly heard a loud hissing noise. It, quote, sounded like air escaping from a liar, he said. Then 25 yards in front of him, he saw a machine rising from the swamp. It was blue-gray, about 20 live feet across and 9 feet high. It was spinning and rose to about 60 feet before moving off. Quote, it was all over in a few seconds, it moved at terrific speed, said Pedley. Then he found the first nest with reeds flattened in a clockwise direction. The Sydney Sun-Herald sent a reporter, Ben Davy, to investigate the sighting, and it was discovered that dozens of people in the area had seen strange saucer-like craft similar to the one reported by Pedley, most of them before his sighting. 
Davy found a total of five nests and published the following description. Quote, I saw clearings in the reeds where they took off, and it was as everyone described it. In a circle roughly 30 feet in diameter, reeds had been cut and flattened in a clockwise direction. One of the nests is a floating platform of clotted roots and weeds, apparently torn by tremendous force from the mud bottom beneath five feet of water. End quote. The second and third nests had been found respectively by Tom Warren, a cane farmer of Uramo, and Mr. Penning, a Tully schoolteacher. They were about 25 yards from the first one, but hidden by dense scrub. In the third nest, which seemed quite recent, the reeds were flattened in a counterclockwise direction. All the reeds were dead, but they had not been scorched or burned. A patch of couch grass, about four feet square and three feet from the boundary of the first disc, had been clipped at water level, thereby adding a new element of mystery. Altogether, the rings varied in diameter from eight to 30 feet. In all but the smallest, the reeds had been flattened in a clockwise direction. Needless to say, policemen collected samples for tests, scientists came with Geiger counters, and the Royal Australian Air Force intelligence people were all over the place. Rumours circulated blaming the Soviets for using the vast open spaces of Australia to develop scientific ideas one or two centuries ahead of those of the Americans. Why the Soviets could not conduct their secret testing in the vast open spaces of Siberia was not disclosed. Neither was it revealed why the pilots of the super-secret communist weapon could not resist the temptation to buzz the tractor of a 27-year-old banana grower. Fortunately, there were several natural explanations for the sighting or the nests, although only one hypothesis accounted for both. The latter was suggested by a Sydney Sun Herald reader on January 30th. He believed the outer space panic in Queensland was caused by a, quote, tall, shy bird with a blue body and red markings on the head, end quote. It was either a type of brolga or a blue heron, but the man did not know the correct scientific name. Many times, as he wandered barefooted through the bush, he said he had seen the birds dancing, but they flew away at high speed before he could reach them. Quote, they would resemble a vaporous blue cloud and would certainly make a whirring sound in flight, end quote. Unfortunately for this pretty and imaginative theory, it got no backing from the Australian Museum. Museum ornithologist H.J. Disney thought the Brolgas could not make circular depressions of symmetrical design. He was similarly sceptical about the bald-headed coot theory advanced by another man, Gulugong resident Ken Adams. Quote, I've never heard of this habit by the bird, Disney said. Donald Hanlon, one of the best informed specialists in the field, has pointed out to me that another explanation for the nests has been proposed locally. They are the, quote, playground of crocodiles in love, end quote. I fully share Hanlon's skepticism about this last explanation because it could hardly apply to the nests found in Ohio, which will be discussed in a moment, or to the damaged wheat field in Montsoreau. A Queensland resident, Alex Bordujenko, who knows about the crocodiles, claims that the reeds are too thick in Horseshoe Lagoon for crocodiles to move through them. So here we are. Dancing cranes are held responsible by some people for bending reeds that are so thick crocodiles, according to other people, cannot move through them. What caused the damage? Nobody knows. On his way home that Wednesday night, George Pedley decided he would tell no one about the spaceship in the swamp. He saw neither portholes nor antennae on the blue-grey object, and no sign of life either inside or about it. Furthermore, he had always laughed at flying saucer stories. But then he met Albert Pennessy, the owner of Horseshoe Lagoon, and disclosed the sighting. He was very surprised when Pennessy believed him right away and told him he had been dreaming for a week that a flying saucer would land on his property. This last detail places the Queensland saucer nests in the best tradition of the fairy faith. The time six months before the Queensland experience, the place, Delroy, Ohio. On June 28, 1965, a farmer, John Stavano, heard a series of explosions. Two days later, he discovered a curious formation on the ground. When analyzed, soil and wheat samples showed no evidence of explosive cause. Wheat plants seemed to have been sucked out of the ground, like the uprooted reeds in Queensland, or the uprooted grass in a French landing of 1954 in Ponce. 
The Ohio incident was carefully investigated by A. Canduso and Larry Movers of the Flying Saucer Investigating Committee, accompanied by Gary Davis. They found the strange circular formation on Stevano's farm, which is situated on a high point. At the center of the ring was a circular depression about 28 inches in diameter. It was probed with a pinch bar, but only loose soil was found for a depth of nine inches. Much of the wheat had been removed, roots and all, and clods of soil a few inches long had been disturbed. The wheat was laid down like the spokes of a wheel. There was no swirling effect as in the tully nests. If we turn from Australia and Ohio to England, we are faced with another incident. Quote, July 16, 1963, will long be remembered in the annals of British ufology. Something appeared to have landed on farmer Roy Blanchard's field at the manor farm, Charlton, Wiltshire. The marks on the ground were first discovered by a farm worker, Reggie Alexander. They overlapped a potato field and a barley field. The marks comprised a saucer-shaped depression, or crater, eight feet in diameter and about four inches in depth. In the center of this depression, there was found a three feet deep hole, variously described as from five inches to one foot in diameter. Radiating from the central hole were four slot marks, four feet long and one foot wide. The object must have landed, if land it did, unseen. But Mr. Leonard Joliffe, a dairyman on the farm, reported he heard a blast one morning at approximately 6 a.m. End quote. On July 23rd, the London Daily Express was to report that nearly two weeks earlier, on July 10th, police constable Anthony Penny had seen an orange object flash through the sky and vanish near the Manor Farm field. On the basis of this limited information, it would seem quite plausible to think that the Charlton crater was caused by a meteorite. Indeed, when a small piece of metal was recovered from the hole at the center of the crater, British astronomer Patrick Moore went to the British Broadcasting Corporation and stated categorically that the crater had been caused by a shrimp-sized meteorite crashing down and turning itself into a very effective explosive. This ended the mystery as far as the scientific public was concerned. But the true facts of the matter, as they became known to a few scientists who pursued the matter further, and to the army engineers who were in charge of the investigation, were altogether different. Farmer Roy Blanchard had sent for the police, who in turn had summoned the army. Captain John Rogers, chief of the Army Bomb Disposal Unit, was the man who conducted most of the field investigations. His preliminary report indicated that there were no burn or scratch marks, no trace of an explosion. And while Captain Rogers stated that he and his superiors were baffled, farmer Roy Blanchard made further disclosures. Quote, There isn't a trace of the potatoes and barley which were growing where the crater is now. No stalks, no roots, no leaves. The thing was heavy enough to crush rocks and stones to powder, yet it came down gently. We heard no crash, and whatever power it uses produces no heat or noise. End quote. Then, on July 19th, it was reported that Captain Rogers had obtained permission to sink a shaft. The readings obtained were rather unusual. They indicated a metallic object of some size, deeply embedded. And it was further learned that detectors behaved wildly, presumably because the metallic piece in question was highly magnetic. At this stage, it should be pointed out, the investigation was still open and above board, possibly because the Army, rather than the British Air Ministry, was involved. And the Army Southern Command Public Relations Officer at Salisbury told researcher Waveney Girvan that the, the object was recovered from the hole. It was sent to a British museum expert and promptly identified as a piece of common ironstone, quote, which could be found buried all over southern England, end quote. The British Museum suggested that it had been buried in the ground for some time, thus eliminating the idea of a hoax. And Dr. F. Claringbull, keeper of the Department of Mineralogy at the museum, destroyed the meteorite explanation, and according to the Yorkshire Post of July 27th, stated, quote, there is more in this than meets the eye, end quote. The last word stayed with Southern Command, however, and it commented wisely, quote, the cause of the phenomena is still unexplained, but it is no part of the Army's task to unravel such mysteries." End quote. If we try to summarize what we have learned from these incidents, the Tully Nests, the Ohio Ring, and the Charlton Crater, we can state the following. 1. 
public rumor associates sightings of flying saucers with the discovery of circular depressions on the ground. Two, when vegetation is present at the site, it exhibits the action of a flattening force which produces sither a stationary pattern, spokes of a wheel, or a rotating pattern clockwise or counterclockwise. Three, some of the vegetation is usually removed, sometimes with the roots, leaves, etc. Four, the effect of a very strong vertical force is often noticed as evidenced by earth and plants scattered around the site. Five, strong magnetic activity has been found in one instance where common ironstone was buried close to the center of the depression. And six, a deep hole, a few inches in diameter, is often present at the center. Do I need to remind the reader of that celebrated habit of the fairies to leave behind them strange rings in the fields and prairies? One Sunday in August, as he wandered over the hills of Howth, Wentz met some local people with whom he discussed these old tales. After he had had tea with the man and his daughter, they look him to a field close by to show him a fairy ring. And while he stood in the ring, they told him, quote, Yes, the fairies do exist, and this is where they have often been seen dancing. The grass never gets high in the lines of the ring, for it is only the shortest and finest kind that grows there. In the middle, fairy mushrooms grow in a circle, and the fairies use them to sit on. They are very little people, and are very fond of dancing and singing. They wear green coats, and sometimes red caps and red coats." End quote. On November 12, 1968, the Argentine press reported that near Nacoquia, 310 miles south of Buenos Aires, a civilian pilot had reported a strange pattern on the ground and investigated it with several military men. Walking to the spot where a flying saucer was earlier alleged to have landed, they found a circle six yards in diameter where the earth was calcined. Inside this circle grew eight giant white mushrooms, one of them nearly three feet in diameter. In Santa Fe province, other extraordinary mushrooms have been discovered under similar circumstances. Another writer, reporting on Scandinavian legends, noted that elves are depicted there as beings with oversized heads, tiny legs, and long arms. Quote, They are responsible for the bright green circles called elf dans that one sees on the lawns. Even nowadays, when a Danish farmer comes across such a ring at dawn, he says that the elves have come there during the night to dance. End quote. It is amusing to note that attempts have been made in the early days of rationalism to explain fairy rings as electrical phenomena, a consequence of atmospheric effects. P. Maranzino, for example, quotes a little couplet by Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of the English naturalist, written in 1789, quote, So from the dark clouds the playful lightning springs, rives the firm oak or prints the fairy rings, end quote. And according to Erasmus Darwin, quote, there is a phenomenon supposed to be electric which is not yet accounted for. I mean the fairy rings, as they are called, so often seen on the grass. At times larger parts or prominences of clouds gradually sinking as they move along are discharged on the moister parts of the grassy plains. Now this knob or corner of a cloud in being attracted to the earth will become nearly cylindrical, as loose wool would do when drawn out into a thread and will strike the earth with a stream of electricity, perhaps two to 10 yards in diameter. Just the external part of the cylinder burns the grass." End quote. The formulation of this idea in terms of modern plasma physics will no doubt soon be provided by eager scholars. They would do well, however, to note the diameter of the cylinder mentioned by the elder Darwin. Two to 10 yards, the diameter of the average flying saucer. Angels or devils? We have already noted several instances connecting unknown beings with the theft of agricultural products. Lavender plants, grapes or potatoes seem to have been taken away with equal dexterity by the mysterious little men. In story after story from North and South America and from Europe, the creatures are seen flighting from their shiny craft, picking up plants and taking off again before amazed witnesses. Such behavior is well designed to make the investigators of such stories assume that the visitors are gathering samples with all the care and precision of seasoned exobiologists. Are we not, after all, designing robots that will accomplish the preliminary analysis of the Martian flora when the first rockets reach that planet? 
In a few cases, the visitors even take the time to interview the witnesses at length concerning agricultural techniques. Such was the case in a landing that, curiously enough, took place in Tioga City, New York, on the very day of the Socorro landing, about 10 hours before Officer Zamora observed the egg-shaped, shiny object so familiar to us now. Gary T. Wilcox, a dairy farmer, was spreading fertilizer in his field. Sometime before 10 a.m., he stopped to check a field surrounded by woods about a mile away from his barn. He wanted to see whether ground conditions would allow plowing. As he approached the field, however, he saw a shiny object, which he first took to be a discarded refrigerator, then a wing tank or some other aircraft part. When he drew closer, he realized that the object was egg-shaped and about 20 by 16 feet, had the appearance of durable metal and did not look like anything he had ever seen before. He touched it. It was not hot. He observed no door or hatch of any kind, and yet two human-like creatures suddenly appeared. They were about four feet tall and wore seamless clothing, with headdress and a full-face hood, which did not allow Wilcox to observe any facial features. They appeared to have arms and legs. They talked to him in smooth English, but their voices did not come from their heads, as far as Wilcox could tell, but from their bodies. Quote, do not be alarmed, we have talked to people before, we are from what you people refer to as planet Mars, they said. In spite of Gary's conviction that, quote, someone must be playing a gag on me, end quote, the strange conversation continued. The two beings were interested in fertilizers and expressed considerable interest in their use. They stated that they grew food on Mars, but the changes in the environment were creating problems they hoped to solve by obtaining information about our agricultural techniques. Their questions were quite childish, and they appeared to have no knowledge of the subject whatever. Each one carried a tray filled with soil. Quote, When they talked about space or the ship, I had difficulty in understanding their explanations. They said they could only travel to this planet every two years, and they are presently using the Western Hemisphere, Wilcox reported. They explained that they landed only during daylight hours, because their ship is less readily visible in daylight and they said they were surprised that Wilcox had seen their craft. They also volunteered information about space travel. Our astronauts would not be successful, they said, because their bodies would not adapt to space conditions. Finally, they requested a bag of fertilizer, but as Gary Wilcox walked away to get it, the craft took off, disappearing from sight in very few seconds. The witness left a bag of fertilizer at the place. The next day it was gone. A list even incomplete, of similar cases would rapidly induce tedium. In most of the South American landings, entities have been described walking away with soil samples, plants, even boulders. Everything in their behavior seems designed to make us believe in the outer space origin of these strange beings and their craft. And indeed, such incidents have greatly influenced the researchers who have independently concluded that the UFOs are space probes sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. On November 1st, 1954, Mrs. Rosa Lotti Dainkli, 40 years old, was going to the cemetery at Poggio d'Ambra Busin, near Arezzo, Italy. A devout Italian woman, she was carrying a pot containing flowers. Her mind at that moment must have been very far indeed from science fiction speculation. And yet what happened to her in the next minute constitutes perhaps the strangest of the entire wave of 1954 incidents. As Mrs. Lottie Dinelli walked past an open grassy space, she saw a vertical torpedo-shaped machine with pointed edges. A machine, in other words, shaped like two cones with common bases. In the lower cone was an opening through which two small scats were visible. The craft looked metallic. It did not resemble anything the witness had seen before. From behind the object, two beings appeared. They were three and a half to four feet tall. They looked joyful. Their smiles displayed white and very thin teeth. They were wearing gray coveralls and reddish leather helmets, similar to those used by military drivers. They had what seemed to be a convexity at the center of their foreheads. Speaking an incomprehensible language, the two closed in on the woman and one of them took away from her the pot containing the flowers. Mrs. Lottie Dinelli now tried to get her property back, but the two beings ignored her and returned to their craft. The witness started to scream and run away. 
but she returned to the spot with other witnesses, including policemen. Too late. Not a trace of the object was left, but it seems that other people saw the craft in flight, leaving a red and blue trail. These stories would be amazing, and nothing more if it were not for one fact known to students of folklore. A constant feature of one class of legends involving supernatural creatures is that the beings come to our world to steal our products, our animals, and even, as we shall see in a later chapter, human beings. But for the moment, let us concern ourselves only with the sample-gathering behavior of these beings and their requests for terrestrial products. In an Algonquin legend, embodying all the characteristics of an excellent saucer story, a hunter beholds a basket that comes down from heaven. The basket contains 12 young maidens of ravishing beauty. The man attempts to approach them, but the celestial creatures quickly re-enter the basket, which ascends rapidly out of sight. However, witnessing the descent of the strange object on another day, the same hunter uses a trick to come close to it and succeeds in capturing one of the girls, whom he marries and by whom he has a son. Nothing, unfortunately, can console his wife for loss of the society of her sisters who have gone away with the flying vehicle. So, one day she makes a small basket, and according to Hartland, quote, Having entered it with her child, she sang the charm she and her sisters had formerly used, and ascended once more to the star from whence she had come. End quote. She had been back in that heavenly country two years when she was told, quote, Thy son wants to see his father, Go down, therefore, to the earth and fetch thy husband, and tell him to bring us specimens of all the animals he kills." End quote. She did so, and the hunter ascended with his wife, saw his son, and attended a great feast at which the animals he had brought were served. The Algonquin story offers a complex mixture of themes. Some of them are present in modern-day UFO stories. Others derive from traditional concepts, such as the exchange of food, which we have already discussed. The new elements are, one, the desire expressed by the celestial beings to receive specimens of all the animals the hunter kills, and two, the idea that intermarriage between the terrestrial and the aerial races is possible. This latter aspect will be examined separately in Chapter 4. So far we have seen our visitors stealing plants and requesting various items, but have they actually killed animals themselves? Have they taken away cattle? if we are to believe the stories told by many witnesses they have. But the interesting fact is that, here again, we find a trait common to both the euphonauts and the good people. On an upcoming page, I shall have occasion to quote, in another context, a story describing a crowd of fairies chasing a deer on the island of Aramor. The storyteller added that, at another time, similar little people chased a horse, and in the same conversation with Walter Wentz, recorded before 1909, the storyteller, Old Patsy, told the following story about a man who, if still alive, is now in America, where he went several years ago. Quote, In the South Island, as night was coming on, a man was giving his cow water at a well, and as he looked on the other side of a wall, he saw many strange people playing hurley. When they noticed him looking at them, one came up and struck the cow a hard blow, and turning on the man cut his face and body very badly. The man might not have been so badly off, but he returned to the well after the first encounter and got four times as bad a beating." End quote. On November 6, 1957, 12-year-old Everett Clark of Dante, Tennessee, opened the door to let his dog, Frisky, out. As he did so, he saw a peculiar object in a field a hundred yards or so from the house. He thought he was dreaming and went back inside. When he called the dog 20 minutes later, he found the object was still there and Frisky was standing near it, along with several dogs from the neighborhood. Also near the object were two men and two women in ordinary clothing. One of the men made several attempts to catch Frisky and later another dog, but had to give up for fear of being bitten. Everett saw the strange people who talked between them like German soldiers he had seen in movies, walk right into the wall of the object, which then took off straight up without sound. It was oblong and of no particular color." End quote. In another of the extraordinary coincidences with which UFO researchers are now becoming familiar, on the same day another attempt to steal a dog was made, this time in Everettstown, New Jersey. 
While the Clark case had taken place at 6.30 a.m., it was at dusk that John Trasco went outside to feed his dog and saw a brilliant egg-shaped object hovering in front of his barn. In his path, he found a being three feet tall, quote, with putty-colored face and large frog-like eyes, who said in broken English, we are peaceful people, we only want your dog. The strange being was told in no uncertain terms to go back where he belonged. He ran away and his machine was seen to take off straight up some moments later. Mrs. Trasco is said to have observed the object itself from the house, but not the entity. She is also quoted as saying that when her husband tried to grab the creature, he got some green powder on his wrist, but that it washed off. The next day he noticed the same powder under his fingernails. The euphonaut had been dressed in a green suit with shiny buttons, a green tam o' shanter-like cap and gloves with a shiny object at the tip of each, according to Coral Lorenzen. We have already explored several aspects of the behavior attributed in modern and ancient folklore to supernatural beings. Whether the creatures come down in flying saucers or musical baskets, whether they come out of the sea or the rock is irrelevant. What is relevant is what they say and do, the trace that they leave in the human witness who is the only tangible vehicle of the story. This behavior presents us with a sample of situations and human reactions that trigger our interest, our concern, our laughter. Joe Simonton's pancake story is cute. The tales of fairy food are intriguing but difficult to trace. The rings and the nests are real, but the feeling they inspire is more romantic than scientific. Then there is the strange being's peculiarly insistent desire to get hold of terrestrial objects, flora and fauna. The stories quoted in this connection verge on the ludicrous, but to pursue the investigation further leads to horror. This is a facet of the phenomenon we can no longer ignore. The Haunted Land If human reactions to the vision of a UFO are varied, the opposite holds true for animals. Their reaction is unmistakably one of terror. To the well-known question that figures in almost every UFO questionnaire, how was your attention called to the object? One frequently finds the answer, my dog seemed terrified. There was a commotion among the cattle. All the dogs in the neighborhood started acting madly. Enough material already exists in documented cases of animal reaction to close exposure to a UFO for an outstanding dissertation on animal psychology. On December 30th, 1966, an American nuclear physicist was driving south with his family along a Louisiana road. The weather was overcast and it was raining. The time was 8.15 p.m. The witness, who is a professor of physics and does nuclear research, and who as a result is a very well-qualified witness, had reached a point north of Haynesville when he noticed a pulsating dome of light resembling the glow of a city. Its color went from a dim reddish light to a bright orange. At one point, its luminosity rose so much that it became brighter than the car headlights. So intense was the white illumination that the two children who were sleeping in the back woke up and, with the physicist's wife, observed what followed. The light was emitted by a source that was stationary and below the treetops, at or close to ground level, some distance into the forest. Concern for his family's safety made the witness drive away. But he did make a quick estimate of the amount of energy represented by the light, and it turned out to be a fairly impressive source of radiation, impressive enough to make him return to the location the next day, bearing a scintillometer with him. He determined the probable position of the object, which had been about one mile, plus or minus 0.2 mile, from his car at the closest point. Then he made some inquiries in the area. The investigations had two results. First, while walking in the forest, he noticed that for some distance around the spot where the source of light had been, animal life had simply vanished. There were no squirrels, no birds, even no insects. And as a hunter, he was quite familiar with the Louisiana fauna. Second, he gathered several reports by local people who had seen the light and claims by farmers that important loss of cattle had occurred in the same period. Until I heard the physicist's testimony, I had never given much credence to reports of stolen cattle. Cows and horses did run away sometimes, or were stolen, and the likelihood that a farmer would try to place the blame on some supernatural agency remains very high even in the 20th century. There is, however, a precedent which cannot be ignored. 
the Leroy, Kansas case, where a cow was stolen by the pilots of a living object. If that report were dated from 1966, perhaps it could be ignored, but it was recorded and sworn before witnesses on April 21, 1897, by one of the most prominent citizens in Kansas, Alexander Hamilton. In an affidavit quoted in several recent UFO books and journals, Hamilton states that he was awakened by a noise among the cattle and went out with two other men. He then saw an airship descend gently toward the ground and hover within 50 yards of it. Quote, It consisted of a great cigar-shaped portion, possibly 300 feet long, with a carriage underneath. The carriage was made of glass or some other transparent substance, alternating with a narrow strip of some material. It was brilliantly lighted within, and everything was plainly visible. It was occupied by six of the strangest beings I ever saw. They were jabbering together, but we could not understand a word they said." End quote. Upon seeing the witnesses, the pilots of the strange ship turned on some unknown power, and the ship rose about 300 feet above them. Quote, it seemed to pause and hover directly over a two-year-old heifer, which was bawling and jumping, apparently fast in the fence. Going to her, we found a cable about a half inch in thickness made of some red material fastened in a slipknot around her neck, one end passing up to the vessel and the heifer tangled in the wire fence. We tried to get it off but could not, so we cut the wire loose and stood in amazement to see the ship, heifer and all, rise slowly, disappearing in the northwest. End quote. Hamilton was so frightened he could not sleep that night. Quote, Rising early Tuesday, I started out by horse, hoping to find some trace of my cow. This I failed to do, but coming back in the evening found that Link Thomas, about three or four miles west of Leroy, had found the hide, legs and head in his field that day. He, thinking someone had butchered a stolen beast, had brought the hide to town for identification, but was greatly mystified in not being able to find any tracks in the soft ground. After identifying the hide by my brand, I went home. But every time I would drop to sleep, I would see the cursed thing with its big lights and hideous people. I don't know whether they are devils or angels or what, but we all saw them and my whole family saw the ship and I don't want any more to do with them." End quote. One more case and the circle will be closed. And it will serve to take a case that has been widely reported and discussed among UFO students, though it has passed practically unnoticed in the national press. A horse named Snippy, missing for two days, was found on September 15, 1967, six miles from the main highway near the Great Sand Dunes National Monument in Colorado. No flesh remained on the head, neck and shoulders, the hide was peeled back to expose the skull, and the vital organs were gone, according to Snippy's owner, Mrs. Burl Lewis, and her brother, Harry King. When they went to the site, they also observed what seemed to be 15 circular exhaust marks covering an area about 100 by 50 yards. A Chico bush had been flattened, and close to it there were six identical holes, two inches wide and four inches deep. As the horse lay about a quarter of a mile from a cabin owned by an 87-year-old lady, Mrs. Lewis and King went to interview her, and she said that she had seen a large object pass over her home at rooftop level on the day Snippy was last seen. She added that without her glasses, she had been unable to determine what the object was. Alamosa County Sheriff Ben Phillips declined to visit the site, stating the horse must have been killed by lightning. A pathologist who did go to the site, however, said that this horse was definitely not hit by lightning. A forestry official who checked the area with a Geiger counter found high readings in the vicinity of the burns, but lower readings as he went away from them toward the horse. The reactions to the report and its sequels have been fairly typical. The University of Colorado, where Dr. Condon was conducting a $500,000 study of UFOs for the US Air Force, sent someone to take a look at what was left of Snippy, who had been dead for a month. I find nothing unusual about the death of the horse, he said. In Ray Palmer's magazine, Flying Saucers, an American ufologist asked in anger, quote, he finds nothing unusual? Perhaps the razor-sharp, clean incision around the horse's neck was the work of a mountain lion. The huge, circular indentation and several smaller ones was that a monstrously fat, fine bird with babies, all suffering with radiation sickness. And four legs? End quote. 
and the newsletter published by the UFO Investigating Committee in Sydney, Australia, drew a most interesting parallel between the Snippy case and a more recent report from Canada. Terry Goodmurphy of North Livingston, Ontario, age 20, and his friend Stephen Griffin, 19, were driving west on Highway 17 about 9.30 p.m. on November 5, 1967, two months after Snippy's death. As they neared the top of Maple Ridge Hill, they saw an orange glow in the sky and thought it was caused by a fire. They stopped to watch and saw it was moving. They drove on again for about three quarters of a mile and then saw the object more clearly as it appeared to maneuver at an altitude of about 100 feet. The two boys became frightened, turned around and notified the Ontario Provincial Police. Nothing was to be seen when the police investigated. However, that same evening something happened at the Lawn Volgenuth farm in nearby Saubri. For on the following morning when a standard bred mare, Susie, and another horse usually came in from a pasture, only the second horse came to the barn and a long cut was noticed on his neck. Susie was not there. It was only after several hours of searching that her owners found her lying dead with her throat and jugular vein cut. Perhaps I have now succeeded in evoking in the reader's mind a new awareness. The suggestion of a possible parallel between the rumours of today and the beliefs that were held by our ancestors. Beliefs of stupendous fights with mysterious supermen, of rings where magic lingered, of dwarfish races haunting the land. Purposely, in this second chapter, I have limited the argument to the mere juxtaposition of modern and older beliefs. The faint suspicion of a giant mystery, much larger than our current preoccupation with life on other planets much deeper than housewives' reports of zigzagging lights. Perhaps we can resolve the point by trying to understand what these tales, these myths, these legends are doing to us. What images are they designed to convey? What hidden needs are they fulfilling? If this is a fabrication, why should it be so absurd? Are there precedents in history? Could imagination be a stronger force to shape the actions of men than its expression in dogmas? in political structures, in established churches, in armies? If so, could this force be used? Is it being used? Is there a science of deception at work here on a grand scale? Or could the human mind generate its own phantoms in a formidable collective edification of worldwide mythologies? Is a natural force at work here? Quote, man's imagination, like every known power, works by fixed laws, end quote. These words by Hartland, written in 1891, offer a clue. Yes, there is a deep undercurrent to be discovered and mapped behind these seemingly absurd stories. Emerging sections of the underlying pattern have been discovered and mapped in ages past by long-dead scholars. Today, we have the unique opportunity to witness the reappearance of this current, out in the open, colored naturally, with our new human biases, our preoccupation with science, are longing for the promised land of other planets. A new mythology was needed to bridge the stupendous gap beyond the meaningless present. They provided it, but who are they? Real beings or the ghosts of our own ridiculous petty dreams? They spoke to us in smooth English. They did not speak to our scientists. They did not send sophisticated signals in uniquely decipherable codes as alien beings are supposed to do if they read Walter Sullivan as any alien being should before daring to penetrate our solar system. No, they picked Gary Wilcox instead, and Joe Simonton and Morris Massey. What did they say? That they were from Mars, that they were our neighbors, and above all, that they were superior to us, that we must obey them, that they were good. Go to Valensole and ask Massa. He will tell you perhaps how puzzled he was when suddenly, without warning, he felt inside himself a warm, comforting feeling. How good they were, our good neighbors, the good people. They took a great interest in the affairs of men and they always stood for justice and right. They could appear in different forms. With them, Joe Simonton exchanged food. So in times gone by, did Irishmen who talked to similar beings. In those days too, they were called the good people and in Scotland, the good neighbors, the slee maith. What did they say then? We are far superior to you. We could cut off half the human race. It does all make sense. These were the facts we have missed, without which we could never piece the UFO jigsaw together. Priests and scholars left books about the legends of their time concerning these beings. 
These books had to be found, collected and studied. They contained no solutions, only elements of great puzzlement. But this puzzlement was documented. Together, these stories presented a coherent picture of the appearance, the organization, and the methods of our strange visitors. The appearance was, does this surprise you, exactly that of today's UFO pilots. The methods were the same. There was the sudden vision of brilliant houses at night, houses that could often fly, that contained peculiar lamps, radiant lights that needed no fuel. The creatures could paralyze their witnesses and translate them through time. They hunted animals and took away people. Their organization had a name, the Secret Commonwealth. In The Magic Casement, a book edited by Alfred Noyes about 1910, I find this little poem by William Allingham, which I would like all ufologists to learn as a tribute to Joe Simonton. Up the airy mountains, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a-hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather, down along the rocky shore, some make their home, they live on crispy pancakes, of yellow tide foam, some in the reeds, of the black mountain lake, with frogs for their watchdogs all night awake.